Hey bingers, welcome back. So I'm just gonna jump straight into it today. There are many decent men and women who are drawn to law enforcement for the right reasons. To protect and serve their communities, to maintain law and order, to pursue and facilitate justice. But there are also many who are drawn to law enforcement for all of the wrong reasons. Chief amongst which is becoming a cop is a shortcut to power. For the narcissistic, for the sociopathic, for bullies and abusers, becoming a cop is the quickest and easiest, most direct route to having absolute power over other human beings. And because police have been, at least in theory, among the most trusted members of the community, they're the authorities, and cops have often been given the benefit of the doubt in many situations. A bad apple, as they call them, who abuses this trust and power is one of the most frightening character types. How helpless we become, how little recourse we have when we're at the mercy of a bad guy in a police uniform. And there are some people who need a badge and a gun to feel like they have any power in this world. And when they get that power, they become drunk on it. It doesn't really feel like there's an easy fix, and there's certainly been no worse time to be a cop in America if indeed you are a decent cop. But fortunately, the widespread use of technologies like dash cams and body cams is helping keep more cops in check and bring swifter and more certain accountability to the ones who are bad. Perhaps if the police had worn body cams back in 1992, today's story would have had a different outcome or at least a less drawn out conclusion. The truth of what unfolded one summer night in 1992 became quite evident the more closely these events were scrutinized. It was 12.30 a.m. in Harris County, Texas in the earliest morning hours of August 25th, 1992. Three deputies with the Harris County Sheriff's Department were on their way to serve an arrest warrant in the community of Old Oaks, which is an upscale neighborhood in the northwest corner of the county, about 20 minutes outside of Houston. The three officers that night were deputies Michael Malloy, Todd Morong, and Kent McGowan, and they were armed with a third-degree felony warrant for Susan White, a 42-year-old three-time divorcee who lived with her teenage son in a large two-story brick house on Amber Forest Drive. Arriving at Susan's home with the warrant in hand, deputies Morong and McGowan knocked on Susan's front door while deputy Malloy walked around to the back door. The arrest warrant was on a charge of retaliation. Susan's 17-year-old son, Jason, had been accused of arms dealing and had been set up for entrapment by a friend of his, a friend who became a confidential informant for the Harris County Sheriff's Department. And allegedly, Susan White had learned that this friend was acting as a confidential informant and she consequently threatened him, hence the charge of retaliation. As the deputies banged on her front door and announced their presence, Susan got out of bed and could be heard approaching. As deputies McGowan and Morong ordered her to open up, she recognized one of the voices outside the door and refused to open it. Get McGowan out of here, she said. I'll open the door if McGowan leaves. But deputy McGowan refused to leave and the deputies continued demanding that she open her door. At that point, Susan White walked away from the door, picked up the telephone and dialed 911. Meanwhile, Deputy McGowan radioed his sergeant and advised that White was refusing to cooperate and asked for permission to bust down the door and enter. With that permission then granted, McGowan and Morong joined Malloy at the rear of the house and Malloy began kicking the door. It took about four kicks to defeat the door, at which point it swung open and a burglar alarm began blaring. Deputy McGowan drew his gun and rushed in ahead of the other two deputies. McGowan raced through the residence, disappearing into a hallway and making a beeline for Susan White's bedroom. From the other room, Malloy and Morong suddenly heard three gunshots. Malloy ran into the bedroom, and there was Susan White lying dead on the bed with three gunshot wounds and a 25 caliber pistol on the floor just feet away from her. You heard me tell her to put the gun down, 
McGowan yelled to Malloy, who at this point accompanied Morong to an upstairs bedroom and found Jason, Susan's son, on the phone with 911. They wrestled the phone from his hand and put the teenager in handcuffs before placing him under arrest and sitting him in one of their patrol cars. With the report of shots fired and an officer-involved shooting, Don Smith and Edward Porter, two investigators from the Harris County District Attorney's Office, were dispatched to the house to review the scene, along with McGowan's supervisors who were surprised when they saw Jason, this alleged gun runner, shivering shirtless in his boxer shorts, looking like a terrified 12-year-old in the back seat of a patrol car. They immediately talked to Deputy Kent McGowan, who fired the fatal shots. McGowan told the investigators that when he and his fellow deputies showed up at the scene, they noticed a light coming from one of the windows. He recounted that they shone their flashlights inside the window to see if anyone was inside. And when they knocked on the door, McGowan said Susan White made it clear she wouldn't open the door unless he left the property. He claimed that after they kicked down the back door, he had approached the bedroom doorway with his flashlight in his left hand and his gun in his right, that he had opened the bedroom door to find Susan White holding a firearm, at which point he said, drop the gun, and then repeated it, drop the gun. Susan White, according to him, failed to comply, and he then opened fire. Up to this point, everything sounded reasonable. There was a gun on the floor in the bedroom, which lined up with what McGowan recounted. So it sounded like a justified shooting. But then, as investigators Porter and Smith were winding down, McGowan said something that felt really sus. Thank you guys for coming to this justified shooting. It was an unusual remark that raised the first of what would become many red flags. Later that morning, investigators sat down and listened to the audio tape of Susan White's 911 call. It began, quote, there's a man standing at my door and he says he's the police. This is what she told the operator. Deputy McGowan is here at my door. I've filed several complaints about him for sexual harassment and I need some help immediately. McGowan has made sexual advances toward me. She can then be heard saying, who's there? Get McGowan away from my house. I want him off my yard and off of my property. She then returned to the operator pleading with her. They are trying to break into my house. She said, please. She provided her address and the operator again asked her to specify who was at the door. I don't know, Susan answered. They say they're detectives, but I have been threatened by one of them. Lieutenant Coons is the one I need to talk with. They're breaking my door down, please. The burglar alarm can then be heard going off. They just broke in, she tells the operator. Six seconds then pass before the call ends. Investigators listened to this audio tape and immediately got goosebumps because it established that there had not only likely been prior contact between Deputy McCowan and the now dead Susan White, the woman he claimed to have shot in self-defense, but she alleged that he had been harassing her and it sounded like she was afraid of him. Also, in listening to the other two deputies' accounts of that night, some irregularities became immediately apparent specifically in how McGowan behaved after the door was broken in and he entered the house. When serving arrest warrants, and especially when making forced entry into homes, law enforcement officers are trained to enter buildings in a specific way, with their weapons aimed straight out in front of them, each movement careful and deliberate, clearing every corner to make sure there are no threats lying in wait. And Susan White had a 25 caliber handgun, so McGowan had every reason to be cautious and follow police protocol. But he didn't. He didn't seem fearful at all. Instead, he ran straight into the house and directly towards Susan White's bedroom with what, in hindsight, looked like a singular purpose. Suspicions at this point just continued to grow, and when Investigator Smith with the DA's office took McGowan into his office to get McGowan's walkthrough of what happened, Smith did something he had never done before. He hid a tape recorder in his pocket and recorded McGowan as he gave his statement as to what happened. That's how suspicious everything was looking up to this point. 
and Smith wanted to make sure he had perfect record of McCowan's initial statement so he could compare his written statement and any future statements against his initial oral walkthrough, just in case details changed. The gist of it was, McCowan said he was leaning in the bedroom doorway with Deputy Malloy trailing close behind him. He said he saw Susan White with a gun in her right hand kneeling on the bed like she was going to sit. He said he told her to drop the gun twice and instead she raised it toward him, leading him to fire at her three times. After McGowan left, Smith asked Porter to go to the hospital where Susan White's body was being kept and examine the wounds to see if they matched up with what McGowan had said. Meanwhile, DA investigator Stephen Clapart pulled McGowan's personnel file and did a deep dive into his background. And the picture that began to take shape of this law enforcement officer was a troubling one. Joseph Kenton McGowan was born on April 3rd, 1965 in Midland, Texas. The son of Carolyn McCafferty and Billy Spear McGowan, a successful Texas oil man and rancher who was, along with his wife, a born again Christian well-liked in his community. But his son, Kent, was another story. When he was in school, Kent McGowan was known as a gun-loving loner who pathologically lied and hated women. He was impressed by wealth and money and loved to brag about how much money he and his family had. This alienated most of his peers, but Michelle Morgan was an exception. She was taken in by Kent's big talk and they dated steadily throughout much of high school, but their relationship quickly became a troubled one. McGowan was violent, controlling, and manipulative. He blamed Michelle for all of his ills and would often threaten suicide in order to get her to do what he wanted. Like when he showed up at Michelle's house one night and put a knife to his own throat. This is something he'd do again and again, or put a gun to his head instead of a knife to his neck. Eventually, Kent dropped out of high school and joined the Air Force, and in 1983, he married Michelle and moved her to Montana, where he was stationed, and away from her family where he could better keep her under his control. And his violent behavior only escalated, so Michelle flew back to Texas and filed for divorce. But McGowan followed and begged her for his forgiveness for a second chance, and she granted him what he wanted. She returned to Montana and before long, she was pregnant with his first child. McGowan returned to Texas in 1984 and entered the one career that, knowing what we know about him up to this point, is the very last occupation you'd want a guy like this to enter, a police officer. He applied for a job with the Houston Police Department and of course was subjected to rigorous screening protocols that included multiple interviews, background checks, and a polygraph test. During the polygraph, Kent was casual, even proud about his prejudice toward blacks, Latinos, Asians, and women. You'd think this would be an automatic disqualification, but things worked a bit different in Texas in the 1980s. Kent was disqualified for sure, but not because of his admitted racism and misogyny. It was another admission he made. He had smoked marijuana once. Per the Houston Police Department's policy, this was an automatic reject. McGowan was hell-bent on becoming a cop though, but he had to wait a full year before reapplying. So in the meantime, he enrolled in community college classes and obtained a state peace officer certificate. When training was complete, McGowan moved with his wife to his father's sprawling county ranch and obtained his first position in law enforcement as a reserve deputy with the Waller County Sheriff's Department. But reserve deputy is an unpaid position and McCowan had to earn his keep working on his father's ranch. Finally, after a full year passed, he reapplied with the Houston Police Department and this time he was hired. He began training in October, 1985, and he was well on his way to fulfilling his dream of being a cop. But problems began to surface almost right away. And within just a few short years, McCowan had a bad reputation among those in Houston PD. He was viewed as a liar, a lone wolf, a loose cannon who liked to do things his way. He liked to brag about his family's wealth, which he seemed confident he would be inheriting before long. And he frequently took credit for the accomplishments and achievements of his fellow officers. His disciplinary record was growing more and more checkered as his career progressed. 
Among the issues were numerous allegations of violence towards civilians, prison inmates, and even fellow officers. Also, and I'm sure you've heard the old expression, don't poop where you eat. Well, Kent McCowan naturally pooped where he ate and began an affair with a fellow female officer, which of course ended almost as quickly as it began. And after she ended their relationship, McCowan did not take it well. You're gonna regret this, he warned her. I'm going to ruin your life. One day, McCowan and the woman had such a heated argument that it drew attention from the internal affairs department. In retaliation, McGowan filed a complaint alleging that she held a gun to her head and threatened to commit suicide, much like McGowan himself used to do with his ex-wife. The female officer obviously denied this, and as a result of the eternal investigation, McGowan was suspended for 45 days and subjected to a psychological evaluation. After further incidents of insubordination, McGowan sensed that his job was inevitably headed toward the chopping block. So to save face, he submitted his resignation in January of 1989. And the brief fling with the female officer was not the first extramarital affair he had had. And for his wife, Michelle, it was the final straw. Shortly after his resignation, Michelle filed for divorce. He'd had multiple affairs with multiple women by 1989 when Michelle decided she'd had enough. And though they reconciled and would get back together and break up again in an on and off relationship cycle, they never did remarry. So 1989 was a rough year for McGowan. And for anybody redeemable, losing your job and your marriage would be a wake up call, but not for this guy. Remarkably, McGowan was allowed to reapply for the Houston Police Department toward the end of the year but he had to first undergo another psychological evaluation. And the result of the evaluation was, it was not felt that he was a good candidate for rehire. He was not police material. In fact, one of his former supervisors had warned against his rehiring, saying that he should never work as a police officer again. It was of this supervisor's opinion that, quote, he'll kill somebody someday. Another supervisor, a desk sergeant at the West Side Command Station, described McGowan as always a problem. The guy was an a-hole, he said. If there was a problem with a patrol car, he'd tear the mirror off so he wouldn't have to drive it. I couldn't prove it, but every time he got a car with no air conditioning, something would turn up wrong with it. So with the Houston Police Department refusing to take him back, McGowan then became an unpaid reserve officer for the Tomball Police Department. He went from one of the highest paying police forces in the county to once again, working as a volunteer. And it wasn't long before he was let go from that department too, after falsely claiming a Colombian drug lord had put out a hit on his family. He then applied with the Harris County Sheriff's Department, which may not have done their due diligence because they hired him. In April of 1992, the Harris County Sheriff's Department made him a contract deputy and assigned him street duty in the neighborhood of Old Oaks. It was here that he first met Susan White, who was exactly the kind of woman Kent McCowan was drawn to. She was tall, thin, blonde, affluent. She lived in an upscale home and drove a white BMW. In her spare time, she did modeling and acting while raising her teenage son. Susan was a divorcee who had been married three times and now she was enjoying the single life. Although Susan's history with Kent McCowan is unclear, it seems likely based on interviews with friends that they may have had a one-time fling. And while Susan wanted nothing more to do with him afterwards, Kent became fixated on her. He began dropping by her house on an almost daily basis, trying to insinuate himself into Susan's life. He'd run into her when she was at her mailbox. He'd drive up and tell her she had beautiful legs and he wanted to take her out. He'd show up on her doorstep and knock on her door nearly every night, trying to strike up conversations with her, backhandedly offering himself up as a protector. You take care of me and I'll make sure Jason doesn't get into any trouble, he told her, which sounds like a veiled threat, like a gangster running a protection racket. Over time, Susan grew absolutely terrified of Kent McGowan, who was revealing himself as a bona fide stalker. 
Susan approached a friend named CJ Harper, who happened to work for the Harris County Sheriff's Department, and told him she'd been having an ongoing issue with a deputy named McCowan. She said he'd been sexually harassing her, bothering her, coming to her house unannounced and uninvited. What should I do, she asked. Harper advised her to contact Internal Affairs and make a formal complaint, which she did. Once McCowan became aware of this complaint, he was enraged. Having lost two jobs with two different departments already and having lost his wife, McCowan saw Susan as a threat to his career and his relationship with his ex-wife, which he hoped to repair. Instead of recognizing his own behavior as a threat, of course. And then magically, within a matter of weeks, McCowan cooked up a sting operation to take down her son, who McCowan was portraying to his colleagues at the Sheriff's Department as a major arms dealer, running with a youth gang and moving guns and weapons. He was portraying Jason as a kind of master criminal, selling drugs, selling automatic weapons, putting on wild drug-fueled parties and involved in burglaries and a host of other criminal activities. Three days before Susan's death, McCowan approached his supervisor to arrange a sting operation where he would get a friend of Jason's named Mike Schaefer to act as a confidential informant, approaching Jason with a desire to buy firearms, and then Jason would sell him the firearm and he'd be promptly arrested, caught red-handed. McGowan's supervisor approved the operation and he had Mike Schaefer, the confidential informant, set things up with Jason, who, as it turns out, only knew a guy who had a gun, one single gun that he wanted to sell. And Jason was only acting as an in-between, if you will. McGowan gave Mike Schaefer $200 in marked trackable bills to pay for the gun. So on August 23rd, Jason was sitting in a car with his friend, Mike Schaefer, who had the money and the other friend who had the gun. After Mike handed over the money, a wrecker suddenly pulled up behind the car and Kent McCowan jumped out in plain clothes. Squad cars then spilled into the parking lot and Jason and his friend were arrested and brought down to the substation. While at the substation, Jason was shown copies of the bills that Mike Schaefer had used to buy the gun. And that's when he first suspected Mike may have been working as a confidential informant with McCowan, whose name and unwanted advances toward his mother, he was already well aware of. So Jason saw the money and knew it was Mike Schaefer. And when Susan came down to the station after Jason was arrested, she somehow knew the whole thing stunk. And she yelled at McGowan, I'm going to get you. Jason ended up being held at the station overnight, but he was ultimately released the next morning without being charged. This was because Jason at no point actually had the gun on him. So he couldn't be charged with possession. When Jason got home, he agreed with his mother that Kent McCowan had tried to set him up, using Mike Schaefer as a confidential informant. Susan White then called Mike's mother and said, I think there's a confidential informant involved. And that's bad business, she then said. Confidential informants don't live long. It was this offhand comment that set the events into motion that would lead to Susan White's death. That night, Mike Schaefer paged Kent McCowan, telling him he was concerned about the phone call. Susan White has talked to my mother, he said, and has talked about a CI being involved. And she said that CIs don't live long. And this is worrying me because people are going to find out it was me and I'm afraid someone might do something to me. McCowan then told him in no uncertain terms, you've been threatened, son. Susan White has threatened your life. I can arrest her for that. McCowan then approached two assistant DAs and spun a narrative about how Jason was a gun runner and criminal mastermind and his mother Susan White was his right-hand woman, a gun-toting mole. And on the night he set out to arrest Susan White, McCowan had approached assistant DA Jim Mount, who had just begun working the midnight shift, relieving Jean Hughes, who had worked from five to midnight. Before she left, Hughes had advised him a deputy would be coming to ask him to write an arrest warrant for retaliation. It all sounded like a run-of-the-mill thing to Jim Mount, who was none the wiser. The Harris County Sheriff's Department is a huge agency. And when Kent McCowan came by, he quickly convinced Mount that Susan White was a true danger to Mike Schaefer and needed to be arrested ASAP. So Mount wrote the warrant without hesitation. 
And even though none of the other deputies working alongside McGowan saw Susan White as a true threat, it didn't occur to any of them to speak up. And when Smith and Porter, the two assistant DAs who were investigating the shooting after it happened, looked at the details of the warrant, they quickly learned that most of what McGowan stated was bogus. The only gun they were able to authenticate the existence of was the handgun that Jason's friend was going to sell Mike Schaefer the night Jason was arrested and subsequently let go. This arrest warrant was indeed looking more and more like a bad warrant, inching McGowan closer and closer to a murder charge. But McGowan seemed unaware that the net was closing in on him or that there was any suspicion about him in the first place. He too had gotten a hold of Susan's 911 call and was playing it boastfully for some of his fellow officers, bragging about having shot and killed her. Anytime you kill someone, he mused, they collect the shell casings and mount them on a plaque and give them to you. Which is complete BS. This is lore that McCowan had made up in his own mind. But he was going around like he was some hero for shooting and killing a middle-aged woman in her own home. And normally, among cases of wrongdoing by law enforcement officers, internal affairs investigators will find themselves confronted by what's known as the blue wall of silence or the blue shield, which is a fraternal code of silence in which cops have each other's backs and refuse to snitch on fellow officers. But McCowan's case was an anomaly. Despite the culture of the Harris County Sheriff's Department being an even more tight-knit brotherhood than most, the so-called blue shield that so often protects bad eggs like McCowan was nowhere to be seen. And one deputy, Al Kelly, who also knew Susan White from the neighborhood patrols, spoke up against McCowan. He had reportedly talked to Susan White not long before her death, and she told him that Deputy McCowan had been relentlessly sexually harassing her and that she was scared of him. And you know, I probably don't even have to say it, but being relentlessly pursued by a male who refuses to cease and desist with unwanted advances, who shows up at your doorstep uninvited several times a week, that alone is scary. But when that stalker is also a cop, Putting myself in Susan White's shoes here, it's easy to see why she was so scared. There's nothing scarier than a bad man with a badge and a gun. And after talking to Susan, Deputy Al Kelly approached Kent and told him to be mindful about his interactions with Susan because this woman was genuinely scared of him. To which McCowan retorted, quote, I'll kill that effing bee. And when McCowan's supervisor, Sergeant David Rajero, approached him to talk to him about Susan White's formal complaint, McCowan exploded. Do you really believe that crazy B? Which so outraged Rajero that McCowan realized he'd misstepped and apologized. During the investigation into the shooting, Assistant DA Steve Clappert and others went to the crime scene to create a forensic reconstruction of everything that went down. First, they timed the path from where Susan White was initially standing to her bedroom, where she was ultimately shot and killed, to see if it matched up with the six second gap between White telling the 911 operator that they'd broken into the house and the point that the call ended. And they determined that she could easily have made it from point A to point B in under six seconds. They also looked at the bullet paths from the bullet McGowan fired from his gun. And this was key. Because McGowan claimed he was taking cover behind her bedroom door when Susan White aimed her gun at him, and he opened fire in self-defense. However, after examining the bullet paths, the trajectory report did not match what McGowan had reported. It showed that McGowan would have had to have advanced at least five feet into the room from the doorway where he claimed to have been standing before firing the fatal shots. And the first shot was to the side of Susan's head passing through the bridge of her nose, breaking her glasses. This established that, contrary to what McGowan claimed, White was not facing him when the first bullet was fired. Rather, she had her head turned in profile when McGowan began firing. And after interviewing Susan's family, investigators learned that Susan White was left-handed and would not have been brandishing a gun with her right hand. And the only fingerprints that were found on her handgun were Kent McGowan's, 
With this, the Harris County District Attorney had enough evidence to charge Kent McGowan with murder. And in March 1994, a jury found Kent McGowan guilty of murder and sentenced him to 15 years in prison. However, at the time, Texas had a law that allowed convicted criminals filing appeals to be free on bond while awaiting the outcome of their appeals for any conviction with a sentence of 15 years or less. And McCowan's sentence was just on the right side of that limit. And of course, he and his attorneys immediately began filing an appeal instead of being sent to prison to begin serving his sentence was released on an appeals bond. And it took eight years before the appeals court reversed his conviction on a technicality. So Kent McCowan would receive a new trial. And during the period that Kent McCowan was free, his wife divorced him and he ended up beginning a new relationship with a woman named Summer Edwards, whom he'd convinced he was an innocent man railroaded, set up and falsely accused. And she believed him. This is as he'd done with other women in his life. He loved bomb her and laid on the charm really thick at first, plying her with flowers, gifts, and cards. But the longer they dated, the more Kent McCowan's facade began to crack. One day, she walked in on McCowan in the master bedroom at the home they shared. He was sitting on the bed, slamming his head into his hands, cursing and muttering to himself. Summer asked McCowan if he was going on about Susan White. And McCowan looked up at her, appeared almost possessed as he replied, yep. After a pause, Summer then asked McCowan if he intended to kill Susan White that day, to which he replied in much the same manner, yep. She asked him why, and he replied, that B needed to be killed. She was effing with me, trying to get me fired. She was going to tell my wife and ruin my marriage. Even though his wife was then his ex-wife and his marriage was already over, And if that wasn't alarming enough, she later found a box under the bed while cleaning the house one day, and inside of it, she discovered a photo album full of autopsy and crime scene photos, the most gruesome sorts of images. She ended up confronting McCowan about this and asked him why he was keeping these, and he replied simply, because they're cool. It was enough to make her literally sick to her stomach. Before his second trial, Summer Edwards went to the authorities and ended up testifying against him at his second trial. And in March, 2002, McCowan was once again found guilty of murder. And this time he was given a sentence of 20 years to prison, which again, seems like a rather light sentence when you consider the big picture of this crime. Kent McCowan was released from prison in 2021. And rather than slipping quietly into the night, he's been really vocal online reaching out to people in the true crime media, trying to clear his name. Please help me tell my horrific story of egregious injustice. He has written to numerous media personalities. Some podcasts have taken the bait and published episodes featuring McGowan as he pleads for exoneration. And McGowan doesn't take kindly to those who still question his innocence and reliability as a narrator. He's even responded to blogs and videos covering his case. And hey, He may even find our little video on YouTube and respond to it in the comments section. So keep your eyes peeled. That's it for this week, bingers. Next week, we'll return with a listener suggested story and a brand new theme, looking at the potential dangers of retail shopping. And I don't mean credit card debt. I'll see you then.